Okay. PDF go. Okay. So yeah, we we missed the beginning of it, but that's okay. We'll go over the the main topics of the uh, of the uh, of the review paper. So like I said, with with the basic overview, any any questions on that? What constitutes an overview? The two things I'm looking for is why that area is important to human civilization and some of the key concepts in that area. So uh, as I mentioned, some of the key concepts in 2D electronic materials would be like that they're um, made from a single atomic layer or just a very few atomic layers, whereas traditional 3D electronics are made from many uh, atomic layers. So there are some advantages of 2D electronics, like you know the, the transport equations change instead of having um, a material that has multiple atomic layers where you're essentially looking at a three-dimensional lattice, the two-dimensional materials become a two-dimensional lattice, the Schrodinger equations modify accordingly, your transport equations modify accordingly, and so you get completely different transport properties. People are really interested in this because um, you can get very high mobilities. High mobilities leads to um, uh, faster transistors and high-speed communication type things. Um, the fact that some of these 2D materials like graphene also happen to be flexible, they can be used in flexible displays or wearable electronics and things like that. Um, and they are nowadays, you know, like, like OLED TVs, you know, the curved displays, those are made of some of, uh, some of the emerging materials. Actually, the, some of those materials aren't 2D. Those are what's referred to as flexible electronics. There are certain types of electronics that can be uh, screen printed, like semiconductors that are inks that you can print using an inkjet printer. That's another actually very interesting topic that's uh, emerging right now in semiconductors. Printed, uh, printed electronics. You think about that, like if, if, uh, if we could print electronics the way we print newspapers on big rolls, you know, that, that can be a game changer for certain applications. Okay, historical progress is the next section that I would like to see. This is important because this will give you some historical perspective. Uh, so in two-dimensional electronic, uh, ele electronic materials, you could trace the origin of, of uh, you know, the first start with 3D materials and then talk about how some of the uh, lower dimension materials started emerging. You definitely want to include something like the d invention or discovery of graphene, which is a very big thing that happened in 2000. 2009 or 2011, I think, where you know this, they actually it was, they they found that a, a very easy way to uh, create graphene is to take scotch tape on graphite and just remove a single monolayer, and that one that was one of the things that won them the Nobel Prize. That was pretty interesting, but um, if you have a bit of a historical uh, a progress, maybe a, some sort of timeline. I think that would be really helpful. Some of the major developments in this field. If you're talking about automotive LIDAR, for example, I think we, uh, you know, we, we talked a little bit about that in the first class. You might want to trace, trace back some of the origins of like, you know, radar technology and how r radar was first used in, in military technologies and then how, how LIDAR came about, how they ultimately got used in vehicles, you know, things like that, something like a, a larger perspective. Uh, so again, like in this area, I'm looking for looking for some sort of timeline, looking looking at uh, a historical perspective, uh, which will require you to know some of the big developments in the field. That's the key thing. You want to know what the big developments in this field have been over the last like five to ten years. Uh, the next one is the discussion of the state of the art in this area, and this one is two to four pages because. It is going to be probably the meat, you know, most uh, the, the the largest chunk of the uh, uh, the review paper. It's a discussion of the state of the art methods, um, you know, in detail. They could be methods that are published in in the academic field. They could be uh, industry devices that are out there. State of the art methods, techniques, demonstrations, commercial products in your topical area. Uh, the, okay, first of all, the reason why we do this, the reason why I want you to do this, is because I want you all to be able to critically evaluate technologies. As an engineer, especially if you, when you become higher level engineers, 
and you become leaders in your companies or wherever you happen to be working, it is critical for you to be able to evaluate technologies and the strengths and weaknesses of each approach. Because this is what engineering is really all about. You may be developing technologies in your own company and you may have different teams working on different approaches to solve this problem. You have to be able to evaluate the strengths and weaknesses of the different approaches to decide which is the best one for you to use. If, you're, if it's not being developed in your company and you're buying them from suppliers, you have to do the same thing, right? Many of you probably know this already. You do this day to day in your engineering, uh, you know, engineering lives. You say like, okay, your boss tells you that we need the system to do this. So you, you look up several different vendors, who's gonna supply your electric harness for the particular vehicle that you're designing like, and why you should use this one versus the other. You, you, you compare all the factors and so on. So the, in, in, the, in the academic or research field, it's not that much different. You're gonna look at all the different state-of-the-art techniques. In the case of 2D electronic materials, you could talk about like the various materials that are out there and what are their figures of merit? How do their, how do their mobilities compare? How, how does it, um, you know, comparing their ease of fabrication, the commercializability, um, toxicity, you know, um, the, the, the fundamental electronic properties. I already mentioned things like mobility, but there could be also things like the, the band gap, the, you know, the typical resistivity, the typical, um, you know, if there's like hot electron effects, like, you know, there's so many different things that you can... Uh, talk about. You, if you look at the example of that review paper on 2D electronic materials, they cover a lot of different materials and so forth. So what you want to do is if someone were to come and read your paper, they'd get an idea of what the potential benefits and disadvantages of the different different approaches are. No material is perfect, so um, you know you talk about the strengths and weaknesses of each one if you're talking about materials. If you're talking about something else, like let's say you're, t uh, I think there was, was there a student here who was interested in, in avalanche photodiodes? Or uh, photodiode detectors? Yeah, Maybe. The, tunneling diodes, no. the tunneling diodes, that's right. So you could look at like the different designs of tunneling diodes that have been published. What are the strengths and weaknesses of each, you know, of each one? If that's the topic you choose to do. Yeah. Uh, so what I'm looking at here is detail, how closely you understand the technologies, and the second thing I'm is using your own interpretation, your own brain to present this stuff. I don't want a, a laundry list of who did what. So and so did this. So and so did this, and they achieved this spec. That's good. That's the first step. That's the first step in the process. So, so I'm not putting that down. That's a very important first step. But then go one step further and, and bring in your own evaluation, your own critical evaluation of it. You know, uh, w one, of the, one of the key things is like every good engineering paper has like one, one or two like key tricks or innovations that, that the paper publishes. And the entire paper is based on that, that special trick. Okay, reading the paper deeply allows you to figure out what that, what that key kernel of innovation is, and that's what the main idea of the paper is. That's one part here. The second thing is um, your, inserting your perspective is like, what do you think are important? Why, why do you think this particular paper is more important than, than this one? Um, and I know that many of you have not, you know, the, the topic that you choose I know that you're not experts in that field. You have not been working on it for 10 years in a row. I know that. But the purpose is for you to learn how to, how to do that, how to think critically about a topic. It's not just about knowing what people have done. It's about like evaluating what people have done from your own critical thinking. All right. In the example of 2D electronic materials, you can talk about like you know the, why the invention of graphene was... Uh, was very important, you know, things like transparency and flexibility. Um, what is the key thing about why, why all the, so many people are using it right now and so forth. Uh, the comparison table is one third to one page, and this is part of the discussion of the state of the art. You could think about it as a summary, is it's a benchmarking table. And so my um, academic 
great grandfather <laughs> was was the person who really impressed us. So I, you know, during grad school, it, it just turned out like my my advisor who was at the grad school, his advisor was also at the same school. So my academic grandfather was at the same school, and that advisor's advisor was also at the same school. So that's what I mean by academic great grandfather. Grandfather. Anyway. He was a very famous guy, Professor Ken Wise. You can look him up. Um, I took a class with him once, and he said, like, this benchmarking thing is central to engineering. And he kept on hammering on that point. Benchmarking meaning, like, you have, you're comparing technologies critically, you know, and the best way to do that is to have a benchmarking table. You know, this is the, the one row of the column, one row of the table. This is the first, this is one technology or one approach. And then in the, the columns of the table, we'll have different performance metrics. So let's say we're working with two-dimensional electronic materials. Mobility will be one of the columns, right? You if you're trying to compare different materials, performance parameters or performance uh, properties and so on, you can come up with what those particular metrics are. Mobility is obviously a very important parameter for, for materials because it determines resistivity and speed and so on. So things like mobility, things like uh, band gap, um, the Young's modulus is a measure of how flexible something is. Um, optical transparency, you know, um, working temperatures, like what are the processing temperatures? One of the, um, one of the cool things about uh, printed electronics is that they can all be made at room temperature, whereas silicon requires temperatures of like 1200 Celsius for certain steps. Right, so that, um, so with flexible, flexible electronics, you can actually print on pieces of plastic, you know? <clears throat> okay, so it's up to you to decide what those performance parameters are, but a nice, a, a very good comparison on the different techniques that you've talked about in the state of the art. Uh, that is the brunt of the paper, and the last part is perspectives on the future. This is the part that really requires the most thinking. And this is, again, I, I do not want to see where you're just reiterating perspectives on the future that have already been discussed in, in a previous paper. You can take ideas from that, that's fine. But you, the ideas that you put here, I want them to be your own. You're coming into this, uh, you're coming into this area looking at it with a pair of fresh eyes. Okay, so don't think that you know, that uh, you can't make any judgments on this field because you're seeing this some of this stuff for the first time. It's true that someone who's been in the field for a long time has perspectives. They may have the unique uh, perspectives on the future of the field, but also someone who's been, who is just going in and seeing this stuff for the first time will also have a unique perspective. So that's also very important. So I want to see your perspective on this field um, from, from your own, you know, from your experience of reading about these different technologies that are out there. So here's some, some questions that can help you think about the, the perspectives of the future. Uh, what are the latest unsolved challenges and open questions in this area? So, you know, with graphene, remember we talked about like that graphene has there's great mobility and it's flexible and it's transparent, but there's an issue with the band gap. It has a very small band gap. In some cases, no band gap. Um, what does the future look like? What are the big players working on? So people are trying to come up with ways to actually coat materials on graphene so that you can modulate the band gap. There was one of the one of the papers that I didn't, you know, I didn't get a chance to cover it in great detail in this class, but the carbon nanotube computer. Um, if you look back on the notes, it's a great paper because they, uh, uh, they talk about um, like some three key engineering challenges that they solved in order to get, in order to make a carbon nanotube computer. Um, so, you know, that's not even a review paper. It's just a good paper, a highly cited paper where they're they're, they are targeting the key challenges in the field. So this is the thing. What are the latest unsolved challenges and open questions in the area? What are the people, what are the big players working on? So I mentioned the example of graphene. What does the future of graphene look like? Maybe it's, you know, um, maybe there will, they will be incorporated in biomedical sensors. Like, you know, who is doing work in that area? 
who is doing work on graphene-based um, detectors or gas sensors, as you know, one of my colleagues here spent a lot of time working on. Um, uh, issues with graphene, like 2D electronic materials, is mass map, mass map fabrication methods that are cheap and also have low surface defects. So that's one of the uh, issues being uh, developed, one of the challenges being worked on right now. Okay, and this is going to be different depending on what, what topic you choose. All right, but that's very important. Again, if you think about it from your own lens, like, you know, if you want to become a leader at an engineering company, you have to have a vision. If you're leading the company in automotive LiDAR, I'm just picking an example, right? You have to know what is out there. And you have to know not just what's out there now, but what's going to be out there in the future, five or ten years from now. You can't rely on other people to tell you that if you want to be a leader in a company. So you see my point? Yeah. So this is an exercise in you becoming, training to become a leader in a company where you give other people the vision as opposed to you getting the vision from a superior. You see what, you see what I'm saying? So th there's a real benefit to you in doing this project. It's not just, uh, it's not just busy work. All right. Uh, the presentation is a 10-minute summary of a topical area, uh, followed by five minutes of questions by, uh, by the class and myself. The reason we're only doing 10 minutes, I would have liked to do longer, but um, you know we have a lot of material to get through in the rest of this class, so that's why I can only give uh, 10 minutes. Um, that being said, those 10 minutes I expect to be of, of very high quality. I, I expect you to cover a lot of ground within those 10 minutes, and um, I want all the students to contribute to that. If it turns out 10 minutes is a real problem, I can extend it to maybe 12, 15 minutes, and then five minutes of QA. Um, but I do want uh, the students to all uh, participate in it. Um, and during the QA, the question and answer session, I also want um, everyone answering questions. I also want students asking questions too. So I'll probably ask one of the questions on the, um, I'll probably ask each team at least one or, one or two questions. But I also want another one or two questions to come from the students themselves. So I, when you listen to these presentations, I want you to think in depth, think critically about it. Think, think about like, hey, you know, like if, um, you know, you showed, you showed this, but, but um, you know, that seems to be a weakness in this technology. How do you think that that could be addressed? You know, something like that. Um, so I'm looking for insightful questions. Uh, in terms of grading, the first two elements are going to be graded within, within the team. The last two is graded individually. The written portion is 40%. Uh, technical depth and breadth. Uh, the clarity of writing and readability is also very important. Um, I'm a stickler for that kind of stuff. I want to see uh, technical depth, but also write it well. You know, uh, finish your draft a week before it's due and just keep on like you know, clarifying it, improve your diagrams, make sure that it's it's well organized. Start with an outline first before you start writing so that you have a logical flow of thoughts. I think just having this, um, you know, having this structure will help you organize your thoughts. But, um, you know, make sure that you spend enough time on making a, a very good and clear readable paper. Um, the 30% will be on the presentation, again, on technical breadth and depth. I know that 10 to 15 minutes is not that much time, but, um, you know, as R Richard Feynman, the famous physicist from the, like, the 1950s, um, if, you, if you're wondering, that it's, uh, look up a book called Surely You Must Be Joking, Mr. Feynman. He's, he's like this famous physicist guy. He, he claimed that any, he won the Nobel Prize, by the way. I should mention that, too. He said that any topic can be explained in 10 minutes or less, any topic. And he was, he was a theoretical physicist, so he was dealing with some pretty complex topics. So he actually had something called the Feynman technique, where the way that he learned a topic is to read about it um, and then explain it to someone else. So. So for that presentation, do you want us to prepare something to display as we present? Like yeah, PowerPoint? like like PowerPoint slides. Yeah, that, that's the best one. Okay. Yeah. Can I ask a 
and the presentation will be like by the, the whole team or individual? I would like team. it to be from the whole team. You know, if you, if you guys can like trade off on slides. Yeah. I know it's not a very long presentation, but. And do we have to send the PowerPoint in advance or can we just come and use a flash drive and put it on? Uh, I'll decide. I don't think I'm going to be too picky on that, but I definitely need the PowerPoint slides afterwards. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. Include. You know, the more or the more visuals you include in your presentation, the better you're able to explain a topic. So one of the things I don't like to see on PowerPoint slides is just a bunch of bullet points. Don't do that. In fact, I often advise my students not to even have any text at all. Just have pictures. Just put pictures on there, but then explain those pictures well. You know, you, you could go the other extreme too, where you just show pictures and say, hey, look at that. It's blue. Yeah. <laughs> you, you have to know the stuff in here when you present it, you know. And uh, uh, we'll, we'll probably record the presentations also. Like, I mean, the way that I record my lectures is very easy to do. I won't necessarily post them online uh, unless, unless you all want to. But, uh, uh, but it, it, it'll be helpful for me in like going over it again when I do the grading. So uh, yeah, the clarity of presentation and, and lastly, the ability to a answer questions. You know, we'll only have five minutes for, for Q&A, but um, I, wanna, I just want to get the feeling that, that you all have, like that each person on the team understands, um, understands it well. 30% uh, um, individual contribution. I should say that that last part about um, answering questions, some of it's going to actually be individual. I think each person will should get like, you know, one or two questions each. And uh, um, so the indiv individual contribution has to do with how, how much does, did each person contribute to the written and the present, presentation part. So you're going to have a statement on who each person on the team is going to submit something that says who contributed what. Um, I'll look at all three of them for, for that kind of assessment. And then I'll, I'll have an idea myself when, I, when, when you do the presentations. Um, you know, I don't want it to be a competition among, um, among like who's doing more work. That, that's exactly the opposite of what I want. What I want is that everyone just contributes equally. Work together on it, learn from one another, contribute equally to it. That's what I'm looking for. Um, and the statement, you know, the, the individual statements that you provide with your, with your report that's confidential is, is just to ensure that, um, you know, if someone on the team didn't, uh, you know, put in enough work on it, then, then it's something that I can, I can assess. And that I, if necessary, I can like try to get some more information about from the, from the team too, um, to make sure that the workload is not uh, off. Uh, okay. So plagiarism, this is the, the very important part. Uh, plagiarism is taking someone else's work, passing it off on your own. Um, it, it turns out plagiarism is a big issue nowadays because we have so much information at our fingertips. Uh, there, it, it is often tempting to copy and paste things into your, um, into your paper, which is very obvious and very detectable. We have like a, a plagiarism checker that, that looks all over the web and it can find any any examples of that. Uh, plagiarism is a very serious ethical violation so it, it, it won't be accepted on this paper and as you know for, for any type of work that you do here at the university. It's not just copying and pasting text from a paper without citing it. Um, well in fact like copying and pasting text is not allowed even if you do cite it you, you cannot copy and paste text. If you, if you just take what someone else has written, like their perspectives and their ideas, and you just like rewrite it in your own words, um, and the flow of logic is exactly the same, it's just a few words changed, that, that's also not um, okay. You have to cite that person. Every statement that you make, you want to cite that, uh, the, the papers that support those claims. Um, another example, but subtle, example of plagiarism is if you write a review paper but 90% of your ideas are taken from another review paper right you see what the where the issue is there is that um, 
a review paper is supposed to synthesize information from many sources, right? So if 90% of your information is just from one source, that's not really a review paper, is it? The idea of a review paper is for you to read a bunch of work in the field, take notes on each one, synthesize your own ideas about it, and write your perspective on that. Uh, there is a, uh, um, a short statement here on the 10 types of plagiarisms to avoid. Maybe we can look at that real quick. There you go. It's a little bit tongue in cheek, but I think, you know. Cloning is identical copying that's, that's copy and paste. Remix. Remix is where you take, uh, um, uh, collects information from various sources. You mix them all together in, in a single document. Now, keep in mind, a review paper is where you take, um, like, think concepts from different sources and you put it into your own words, but you're adding your own perspective to that. Okay. If you just, like, copy and paste one section here, copy and paste another section here, it, it's not going to work. Like, our, the, the plagiarism checkers check all that. Um, Okay, control C, obviously. Um, in the hybrid type of plagiarism, perfectly cited source documents are copied and arranged as, as a new document without citation. Find and replace. <laughs> Undergrads do this to get away from the plagiarism checker, but they'll copy and paste something and then change a few keywords so that the plagiarism checker doesn't... It, it still finds it. It still finds it. So that's not the point. You know, the point is you want to, like... Synthesize the information and write it in your own words. So there's, you know, there's a bunch of examples of this. Okay, lots of stuff to cover. It seems we've already we're already at six thirty here. Um, there's more detailed examples of plagiarism here. Um, so as I mentioned before, we do have an automated system here that we use for plagiarism checks, and it looks at virtual, virtually all the web sources and published work, including work that was published at, you know, by students at universities. Uh, they, it assigns a plagiarism score of um, somewhere between 0 and 100%. And uh, <laughs> I, I, I once knew of a, of a student actually in our department who didn't do it intentionally but he I guess I guess he didn't know what exactly plagiarism was and um, in the country that he was from it was just sort of accepted that synthesizing things from other sources meant that you just copy and paste them and it was still considered original work well his plagiarism score was like 95 <laughs> percent and and I looked at that and I was like, you know, my eyes just like fell out of their sockets. You know? <laughs> uh, and so obviously, you know, we corrected the thing, you know, he rewrote it, he rewrote it and things like that. It, it was it was okay in the end. But the point is like plagiarism is, um, the seriousness of plagiarism is, it, it, it's taken very seriously at uh, most U.S. universities and certainly this one. I actually have a family member who plagiarized himself Oh yeah, apparently, but yeah, apparently that's a thing too. By where you just copy and paste your own work. Yeah, basically. Right. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that can happen too. <laughs> so sometimes, like, uh, yeah, uh, um, researchers will just like, you know, copy and paste portions of their own paper into new into new work. Oh, that's no, we'll yeah, it's not allowed. <laughs> on that paper you put up there earlier, you had yourself cited on there, right? Yeah. Yeah, I was doing that actually. No, just kidding. <laughs> I, I did cite myself, but that that was a um, it was a citation to a different paper on a different topic. That was like one of the components that were used in in the thing. So what what you're not allowed to do is like you can't take like copy and paste sections of other papers and copy it into this paper. So what's the purpose of having it published in two places at once? You know, that's that's. What, um, okay, and then final tips and information. There's actually, uh, like, I found f a bunch of links, but these were the four most useful ones, as they're, they're tips on how to write review papers. Okay, I've already given you a structure here, so I think you can mainly go off this, but these have, like, other very helpful, uh, very helpful tips. 
Some of them is like how to write it, how to avoid plagiarism. And some of it, one of them was interesting, was talking about like how to avoid the feeling that you don't know what you're talking about. You know, like that you, you start reading some of these papers and you get so lost in the details that you're like, okay, I'm never going to understand this. You, know, you read as much as you can, you read as much, you synthesize as much as you can, understand as much as you can, and then when you're tired, you come back to it the next day. I expect there to be a lot of things that you don't understand, and I also expect that you will take the effort to uh, delve into it and really try to uh, understand the important technical issues, the important scientific concepts in the area that you um, that, that you choose. <clears throat> so this will take time, you know, this will take effort to do. That's why you're doing it in a team. That's why you're doing it together. I encourage you to share ideas, um, split up the responsibilities. You know, if you have, there's a several uh, papers that need to be read, important seminal papers in your field, split up the work and discuss with each other, share the ideas with each other. If you're reading two papers that are in a similar field, one person reads this one, one person reads this one, you talk, talk to each other and exchange the ideas, say, hey, this person did this, this person did this, and your, your understanding grows very quickly from there. Okay, um, questions? I covered a lot here. Okay, yep. You told that the presentations in class presentations will be on the first week of December, right? Correct. Will that be on Monday or Wednesday? I haven't decided yet. Um, do you have a conflict on one of the days? Um, no conflict, but if it is Wednesday, then I think we'll get enough time. Okay. It is possible that, that all the teams can go in one day. I think we have five teams. If each team goes at like 15 minutes, then that's an hour and uh, hour and 15 minutes. Our class is an hour and um, about an hour and a half, hour and 40 minutes. So yeah, we might be able to fit all of them into the Wednesday class. But when we come closer to it, I'll, I'll let you all know. You know, I'm happy to meet outside of class time too, but I know that you all have work and you all have other classes and things like that, so I'm trying to avoid it. Nadine, yeah. What is the second event that you missed the Um that's a good question. I'm gonna uh, I'm gonna look at the dates and we will talk about that on Wednesday then. Oh. Yeah. All right. So let me uh, let me just save this recording and then we'll go on to the class lecture.